Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue looking at 1 Samuel and find, see what we're going to find. So there's definitely some interesting things here in chapter 1. But before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here. So we are so thankful for this new day and the opportunities that you give us to know you and uh, to walk with you as we uh, go through this journey of life. We know, Lord, that you have a purpose, and we ask that we can conform our lives to your purpose and plan for us, that we can hear your voice speaking to us, and that we can that you can speak through us to others. We are thankful, Lord, for this study, and we just ask that your Holy Spirit can enlighten our minds, and that uh, we can be strengthened spiritually. We pray for each one, you know, the struggles that we face. Help us, Lord, to cling to you. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so gone through a few of these verses. And again, this is just, we, we're doing this not in, in great detail yet, uh, but it will some more detail will arise as we go through this. Okay, so here's where we were. So we know that there is this um, Hannah. She she goes to the sanctuary there in Shiloh. Eli is sitting on uh, at the front gate there watching. And we, we believe that he represents leadership in some some manner. And there is this sort of misapprehension regarding Hannah's actions. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, I wish Kelly was here, but he's not. But um, So Kelly had a conversation with uh, the pastor there in Maple Ridge, BC, while he was, the pastor was driving. And it was re really interesting. So, I mean, they talked a lot about the different uh, problems in the church, the different offshoots. And it's something, of course, that we all have experienced. Uh, how do we deal with those who are erring, right? And so we talked about the fact there's so many winds of doctrine blowing right now. Now, when I became an Adventist in the 80s, Adventism was, I mean, it wasn't definitely wasn't perfect, but it was a lot more uniform. That is, there was not, there wasn't a lot of offshoots. There was a few here and there. Uh, pretty minor little things. Now, of course, probably the internet has helped magnify and expand that, but it 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 so it has been, you know, for a while growing. But the types of errors that have developed. Now, there's a reason why these errors happen. So one of them is uh, Kelly talked to the pastor about you know when Kelly got disfellowshipped, which was which was really kind of crazy. I mean. Kelly, you know, had been an Adventist for 35 years, very active. He was a Sabbath school teacher. He always was driving people to church, bringing uh, new converts to church, witnessing to people. He had lots of people that he had witnessed who has who's been baptized. Um, and, uh, you know, just a very effective church member. And the thing about Kelly is back you know, back then, so he got uh, disfellowshipped in uh, 2013, I believe, July 7th, 2013, if I remember correctly, if that was the year, I'm pretty sure that was. And, uh, but back, you know, before that, I mean, Kelly, Kelly's always been a, a networker. I mean, Facebook was designed for Kelly, right? I remember when, uh, when I was, uh, was still 18. It was before my son Matt was born. And uh, Kelly came and visited us in uh, 100 Mile House, BC. And, you know, he had this little black book with phone numbers and birthdays and names of kids. And he would spend a part of his day every day writing letters to people. You know, it's like, who does that? I guess people like Kelly. So anyway, um, you know, he's always been active and always minister and there he was ministering to to me and, and Levine my first wife 
you know, telling us about the state of the dead, sharing what he understood. Um, I wasn't, you know, we weren't Adventists yet. And I didn't really become an Adventist from Kelly's influence directly. You know, I sort of studied in on my own. I did know about Adventists because he was an Adventist and I did know what they believed about the state of the dead. And, but it was Jehovah's Witnesses who were sharing with me. And then I, we had a concordance and it's a long story. But the, the point is, Kelly was very, very active. And when he was disfellowshipped, I mean, it was, it was because of fear, right? The type of fear, the type of fear that becomes anger. Have, have we ever seen that recently in the last, uh, you know, four years or so? Fear that becomes anger. Where does that come from? Fear. Um, people not understanding. Okay. Do, do we got any biblical uh, verses on fear? I mean, we, we think about the fear of the Lord as beginning of wisdom, right? When we think about fear, but that's a different type of fear. What, what type of fear is this? This isn't a godly fear that people have. What are people frightened of? Things that are unknown that they've not experienced. Okay. So let me see if we do a little study on fear here. Now, one of the verses I'm thinking of, those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, right? So there is a fear that's a godly fear, and there is a fear of death. Of course, angels come and say, you know, fear not. So some fear is good. Some fear is bad. So not, not amounts of fear, but types of fear. Yeah, there's the verse, another verse. First John 4, verse 18. I knew it was probably in First John. Because that was one of my brother David's uh, favorite verses. <clears throat> right. So there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect, right? So there is this this type of fear is um, it's obviously uh, causes people to act in um, irrational ways. So 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 what I saw uh, happening, uh, what 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 happened with Kelly was was fear. People fear of the unknown, things that they don't know anything about. Anyway. The conversation he was having with the pastor was all about all these different offshoots and his experience with different people. And some of them were definitely, from what he was describing, pretty fanatical individuals. And Kelly had started it off about some guy who was at the center there who was uh, not an Adventist, but a guy who's just really into conspiracy theories. And, and then Kelly shared a bit about some of the people like the Canadian and American groups that we were a part of and the type of fanaticism that's there, right? And, you know, it's hard for a, a pastor to distinguish, you know, when a person has fear, uh, to sort of distinguish that, why does, why does this fear exist? What is the purpose of fear, this type of fear? We, we can say that it's, it's not of God, uh, but what is the purpose of this fear? Where, where does it come from? How is it manifested? What's... What's behind it? Should should a Christian fear anything except God? No, <clears throat> no. And I remember back when I was, I must have been still 15, but my brother David telling me not to worry about, you know, other people, basically, um, that I cared about, right? The, the decisions that they were making. Um, he said, you know, God has a purpose in the things that happen. And and you you can pray for people, but you need to trust that God is going to take care of them. Now, this is before I was converted, but, you know, he was sharing me with his his faith. And it's something that always stuck with me, that I can trust God. So can we, can we say that this type of fear is a lack of faith? Yes. Okay, right. So when it comes to dealing with error, because we're supposed to be watchmen, right? Often what the role that, that we try to take on is to be like Eli at the, the gate of the sanctuary, watching for any error. But one of the things, the characteristics about Eli is he's going to rebuke Hannah. 
and we're going to find later, what about his sons? Does he, does he address the problem in his own family? No. Okay. So, so what does that illustrate? If, if he represents the leadership of the church and, uh, so, so this is something that, that has always existed. It's not something to be discouraged about or to be self-righteous about, right? That is, we don't look down on the church and think we're better than them, you know, than the organization. But what is the problem? How would we characterize this in, in, in the context of the present day? Is the church addressing the problems that exist within the church itself, or is it looking more trying to address the problems outside of their control, if that makes sense. They're always looking to address things that are outside their control. Right. And, and, and that's us, right? I mean, that's a very common aspect of human nature, right? So the church just manifests, the leadership just manifests human nature. That is, we rather deal with some problem that that is somebody else's problem, really, right? Instead of addressing the problems in our own house, right? So you, you see some families, they have all kinds of problems, but they talk about their neighbors and all their neighbors' problems, right? Or people who, who personally have a lot of issues, but they're always focused upon the sins of others. And, and yet we have no control over the sins of others, but we do have control over our own sins, we do have control over our own house, so to speak. So in thinking about this, thinking about this issue, this fear that exists, it is definitely a hindrance to receiving the truth. That is, we just group everyone in all of these winds of doctrine. Anything that we hear that seems unusual or out of place, we just assume that that is some great error and we shouldn't listen to it right this is this is a general attitude there's a fear that exists when we are not connected with god when we don't have trust in god ourselves and also the problem exists within many of those people promoting these various ideas right so obviously i've i've the things that i've studied there's so much prejudice against it because I'm associated with people who are fanatical, right? Some of them definitely are fanatical. And that has made, you know, my work more difficult in um, being involved in the church in, in the ways that I would like to be, right? Because I never push any ideas on anybody, but other people have. So our role is not to push even light that is given to us that we believe is from God, we have to share that light with those who are willing to receive it, not, you know, push, push things on people. And often we experience this when we first become Adventists. Um, we can be a bit overly zealous, you know, all of our relatives, our friends, we want everybody to hear about what we've learned. And, um, you know, I remember once I had a friend who was, uh, you know, that when I was growing up and, and he ended up, visiting me like this is a few years after I was married I was living back in the house I grew up in and um you know I, I was uh going to an evangelistic series when he, he stopped by and I said hey you want to come so we went to this evangelistic series and um uh you know he heard a you know a sermon on on the sabbath dealing with the sabbath and then then he, when we came back to my place I dumped everything on him right it was like a dump truck sort of thing. I just, everything I knew, everything I'd heard, I, I never seen him since, right? You know, I scared him off. And, and, and I did that with a lot of people initially. Now, some of them, of course, you know, relatives and family over time, they, they, you know, they saw my character and how I dealt with things. And, and, uh, you know, they, some of them came to believe like I do, but, um, you know, we have this this problem that we we somehow have to sort out in our own lives. So we know that uh, that what's being represented here is is something that is a message that is not being heard 
right? So if we're taking Eli to represent the leadership of the church or the movement, whichever level we're wanting to look at it as, and Eli is not a bad person, right? And he says, go in peace, God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. But we're going to see later that Eli has some major problems, which is going to be manifested in his children. So which would represent, of course, the priesthood, right? So we'll see this as we go through this. Okay, so those are just some thoughts. You know, how do how we deal with people who we see as being in error? We all know the quote Ellen White says, you know, if a brother differed with you on certain points of faith, you know, don't make him out to be a heretic, misrepresent his words, but sit down with him and in a Christ-like spirit, you know, study with him because you may be in error. There may be things, I'm paraphrasing this, of course, that he understands that you don't understand. And you have to see maybe if you are in error, right? So that takes a connection with God to have that confidence in faith that God is going to take care of the problems that exist within the church, within other people, things that we have no control over, that we can trust that God can use us to minister to others in spite of what we see in ourselves, that he's still going to be able to use us if we seek him each day. So I think these are important points that we always have to keep in mind. Okay, so getting to 1 Samuel 1 verse 19, this is just two verses that finish off this section. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Rath Ramah. So I'm pretty sure that's just a shortened form of what's the name of the place? Zophim, Rathayim, Zophim, right? So Ramah. Or Arimathea. Or Arimathea, right? So it's just a short form of the name of the city. So that's where they live. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And therefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I've asked him of the Lord. Okay, so if we're going to just take this story sort of as, um, we'll use it in more of an allegorical sense. So we're going to say that we have Eli representing the leadership. There is this brokenness of spirit that Hannah has because Christ's character is not formed in her, right? She's seeking to become like Christ. And so she's pleading and begging God. It's it's um, misperceived by Eli, by the leadership. But in her earnestness, he recognizes, the leadership recognizes, Eli recognizes that, you know, this if this is of, of God, you know, then God bless you, right? If it's his will. Now, so we have this, um, wherefore it come to pass when the time was come about after Anna had conceived. Now, that's a bit awkward in, in English um, from this translation in the King James. Now, the, the translators give us an alternate reading, wherefore it came to pass in revolution of days about after Anna had conceived. I'm not sure if that's even not more awkward, but so so what's being described there, just in, in the simplest terms? A year. Okay, well, not necessarily a year. I mean, we're, I'm not I'm not perfectly certain. So the word that is translated as time is days. Okay. And now this word tekufa is um, you you guys wouldn't be familiar with it, but there is um, we all all are for familiar with um, uh, the head of the year. Right. So the head of the year is when in the Jewish calendar. Isn't it in the spring? No, it's in the fall. Right. <clears throat> the head is is um, 
sometimes referred to like as the top of the, so it's like the top of the year. So we know the Jewish year is like a circle. It's a cycle. And the return of the year, that is this word tekufa, right? So it, it is connected to the return of the year, which occurs in the spring. So, you know, Rosh Hashanah is the, uh, the beginning of the year. That's the new year in the fall. And you can see uh, Rosh is the word uh, head, right? Hashanah is year. So when we say Rosh Hashanah, we're saying the head of the year. And then uh, they have, to, um, I always forget how to pronounce this. So they translate it was come, and, but in the they say in a revolution, right? Uh, or literally the days of re revolution. Now, but I would say that this means that he was born in the spring. But I could be wrong, but it's just that they use this to refer to the beginning of the year in the spring. And I could show you some verses on it. Uh, it's usually translated for the return of the year. So you can see how a return is connected. And it's, it's not the word shuv, which is often returned. Return. Let me see if I can find this. Is it translated as turn of year? No, it's. Yeah. So it's going to be in First Kings 20, verse 22 and 20, verse 26. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, go strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. Right. So that, um, that word here, in, it's a little bit different number, but uh, Teshuba. So, so it's got a little bit different ending to it, but it's basically the same idea. So it's uh, this revolution. So it is possible that Samuel is born in the spring. Now, what would that mean? Which feast would they have been at? That, that's kind of the question that I'm, I'm asking here. So if he's born in the spring, I mean, it could be that they were at, you know, they were there for the Passover. It doesn't tell us what, because they go there in the year. So it could be a year later, right? Because she wouldn't have necessarily conceived right away. So, but she's, she conceived. And does that make sense to people? You understand what I'm sort of what I'm getting at here? That either it was the Passover, or if if the if um, when she has a son at the Passover, when would the son have been conceived? I guess is the question. Would you repeat that, please? Okay, so if he's born in the spring, when would he be conceived? Um, and so possibly, which was the feast that they had attended? Right, because there's three times in a year they go up to the sanctuary. Right, that is it, Passover. Feast of Weeks, and um, in the fall types, right? So in the fall, dealing with the yeah, Day of Atonement and Feast of Tabernacles, right? So there's these three holidays in the sense of holy days that people would celebrate, right? So Hannah and her husband and, and Penina and their kids. If, if, this, if this was to be considered that he, he was born in the spring it would have had to have been the feast of weeks yeah so so that's what i'm thinking but you know i can't prove it right like i mean i can't i can't definitively say but but it is possible that it was the feast of weeks and and we've seen already the symbolism in the story of samson with the feast of weeks right so i mean so i mean it could have been any of those three feasts and, and it could have been the Passover, too. It could just be a year later, right, that she didn't conceive right away. But I'm pretty sure that what's being referred to here is the return of the year, even though it's talking not about the return of the year, but the revolution of days. Now, that could just refer to um, the cycle of of um, this, you know, the, the, the time of um, yeah, the word gestation, right? So how long is that? We, we have it as nine months, which is roughly how many days? Uh, what, about 285? 273. Okay. 
right? Generally, in Iran has it there, right? So what's the symbolism of 273? 27th day of the third month. Okay, well, yeah, March 27th. But it comes from the Levites, right? The redemption, uh, the redeeming of the Levites to replace uh, the firstborn. So remember, we talked about in our studies, and I'm just reviewing this here. So we have this, the right of the firstborn. And that's going to be passed down through the firstborn is what it's supposed to be, but it's not always going to be. We're going to see Esau, Esau is the firstborn, but it actually goes through Jacob. Right. And then Jacob, he's going to divide that birthright to Levi, um, Judah, and Joseph. Right. So Joseph gets the double portion. He gets the two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, each get to be a tribe. And then, of course, Levi is going to receive the priesthood and, and Judah the kingship. So the, the Messiah is going to come through Judah. Right. Christ is going to be a son of David. And with the priesthood, because uh, the priests now are going to have, they're not going to receive an inheritance of their own piece of land. They're going to be dispersed among uh, the different tribes, right? So they're going to, there's going to be cities of the Levites where the priests go. And they're going to have this series of courses of time that they serve, right? So there's going to be 24 courses of priests where they will serve throughout the years, twice in a year that priests serve in the sanctuary. But anyway, that's a lot of detail. The main thing here is that we're going to have, um, since the firstborn was normally the priests, since the Levites are taking over that role, the, the, the other tribes are going to have to pay a redemption money for the difference in number between the number of the Levites and the number of the firstborn of the children of Israel, and that number is 273 persons, right? So there's 273 Levites, more than the children of the firstborn of the children of Israel, right? That's, that's if I'm getting okay. that right. So we can see that number 273 in this story, anytime you have a, a child that's going to be born, that would be the number of days of gestation. As, as a symbol, right? So 273 is also here. And you can see why 273 is connected with the firstborn and, and also with the, the children of the Levites, right? So we can see that there, God has put in there, he's put this symbol of 273 in having that, the number of days that, uh, that a woman, uh, has a, a child, right? The, the, to time of gestation. Okay, so um, so I know I'm, I'm not pulling these all together in a nice, neat way, but we can start to see some of these connections. She's, she's praying for this man-child, and the symbol that's attached to, to birth is this 273 number, which is connected to the Levites, to the birthright. So is, is that clear to people, that this is an intentional symbol that 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 adds to the story. It doesn't like give us something new and different. It just adds to the story. Is everybody fine with that? Or does it need better explanation? Or can somebody explain it better? I don't know that I could explain it better at the moment. I'd have to think about it. Okay. And this is verse number 7,233 you're saying around? This, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we got the symbol of 273 there with the two threes, but still 273. Okay, interesting. Now, we also have, of course, um, a symbol of time, right? Now, of course, the word time there is just days. So the word time doesn't actually exist in the Hebrew, just the revolution of days. Uh, and then we also have Samuel's name. So Samuel means asked of God. And so how does that connect to this story? Now, the, the Hebrew number is 8050. I'm not sure if I can get anything from that number itself. So, yeah, so it goes, comes from Shama, which means to hear. Now, I've always had it that God has heard, but um, uh, but here we have asked of God. 
Yeah, so I, I always think of it as God. God is heard, not asked of God. But they have it as asked of God. And then, of course, L, just the name of God, right? So, so what's the significance of this? What's the significance of Samuel's name? Well, <clears throat> the significance is a direct answer to Hannah's prayer. Okay, there, yeah. So she has an answer to her prayer, but she's symbolizing either a movement or a message, right? Right. Okay. Um, we, we would say basically the five wise virgins, right? This two classes. And 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 she she asks after, and what she's looking for is the character of Christ. So one thing we can say just on a simple level is that that none of this comes from man, right? This is from God, right? And often people, you know, we, we want to reflect Christ's character, you know, we don't want to be bad, uh, but often we can, we can sort of look at ourselves and see the improvement in our lives and take credit sort of for what, what we see. Of course, you know, we're definitely uh, deceiving ourselves if we see that we're good. But people do that, right? They want to they want to see themselves as good. Right? So we can fool ourselves, but Hannah isn't. Right? So she's she's gonna have the character of Christ. And and this son, of course, is going to be dedicated to God. Right? So that that's important. So she has already made that vow. She's vowed a vow. Right? So she asked of him of the Lord. God has heard her prayer. Anything else in this story? We've got this time, this revolution of days. We know that God knows no haste or no delay. His purposes are fulfilled at the, the appropriate time. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll come back to this. So I know there's still a lot we're missing. No, it says, and the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. Now, again, we, we know that in uh, the Hebrew, um, they have translated this here uh, yearly. But but this actually in this verse, it just has doesn't have year by year. It just or day by day or anything like that. It just has a uh, day. Right. Or yom. So the man of Canada and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord this the the daily sacrifice and his vow, right? So I'm not sure why this has yearly when it's just the word yom. Could they be trying to give a reference that this was because this was one of the ordained feasts? Could be. Now, Young's literal translation says the man Elkanah goeth up and all his house to sacrifice to Jehovah, the sacrifice of the days and his vow. Okay. So I'm just not really sure why it's, why, um, what, what this is referring to. The well, sacrifice. If it was the sacrifice of the days, you, you would have it either as the the sacrifice for the Passover since that was to be done on the fourteenth day of the first month, mm -hmm. yeah. Or with again the Feast of Weeks, which would have been after the Passover. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and uh, yeah. So I'd like to be able to connect this to some specific feast. I just don't know. Yeah. So either the Passover now. The, the main point here is, but Hannah went not up. So after the child is born, Hannah's not going to continue going up, right? For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, she could go with her child and you know, go back and forth, right? It, you know, until he's weaned, but she's not going to, right? She's going to stay there. And then Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, Harry, until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. Now, you know, how long this goes on, this weaning, we don't know. 
Uh, there is an example in scripture of three years, and we know Isaac was redeemed for five years. So she's going to have her child there with her for a time. And we also have the word tarry. Now, of course, the word tarry has to do with the parable of the ten virgins. In Millerite history, it becomes a symbol or a waymark. So some of these things, when we start drawing these on a line, we would have to mark the tarrying time uh, occurs after the arrival of the second angel's message, right? Here's the tarrying time. So exactly how we're going to fit this in or what we're going to see, I still don't know, right? But we're still look, examining these pieces of the puzzle. So why is she not going up? Like, obviously, we know what she says. But is there any symbolic connection here to her Terry until he's weaned? Okay, this might be a stretch. Yeah. But there's an old adage that the Catholics use. Give us okay. a child until they are seven. They will be a Catholic for life. Now, what if Hannah had observed the character. the character of Eli's sons. Right. That That's kind of where I'm thinking, is that she's, she just like, um, remember in the story of Joseph, of course, uh, Joseph is going to be with his mother, not till just after he's weaned, but until he's uh, what, 12 or 13 or whatever. Right? No. Or till how old? Okay. How old is Joseph? Not, not jo what am I saying? Uh, Moses. I'm talking about Moses. Thank no, you. It's, uh, it's yeah, I meant so Moses. It's more like, yeah, it's more like when Christ was uh, was taken, went to the temple. It's more like the same time. Yeah, so Moses. Yeah, I'm thinking, of, I said Joseph, though, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask you where you were getting this because... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, yeah, so Moses, right? So so there's going to be a time that Moses is being trained. And and so I'm thinking here that Hannah has is trying to instill some basic things in her child before she gives him to uh, the service of the sanctuary. Also, she wants to spend time with him as well, you know, but... Um, but she's going to lend him to the Lord, but not right away. And so how long that is, we don't know. And, um, uh, yes, there, there is a quote by Ellen White concerning Samuel yeah. when he is 12 years old. And I think that is when, that is when he uh, gives that message to Eli. That is like a tingling in his ears. Yeah. So I think he's there before that. Yeah. But that's when God gives Samuel the message. And yes, Moses as well. He was 12 years old when yeah. he w left, uh, left his, his mother, his parent, his parents to be with Pharaoh's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but I don't think Elkanah is going to have Samuel until he's 12, but it's going to be when he's 12 that God speaks to him. So we'll see that in this story as we go along. But so how long she has him, we don't know. Now, now, as far as how this words this in the King James, well, you know, here's what it says in Young's literal translation. For, well, I'll read verse uh, 22 and 23. And Hannah hath not gone up, for she said to her husband, till the youth is weaned, then I have brought him in, and he hath appeared before the face of Jehovah and dwelt there unto the age, instead of there abide forever unto the age and dwelt there unto the age. I'm not sure why, but that's what it literally is in, in Hebrew. And Elkanah, her husband, saith unto her, do that which is good in thine eyes. Abide till thy weaning till thy weaning him. Only Jehovah establish his word, and the woman abideth and suckleth her son till she hath weaned him. So when we look at these different words here, staying on. And there's that. So, yeah, that word that's translated forever is olam, which is an age. Uh, it could be translated as forever. And then dealing with, uh, yeah. and so this word, sakur sakling, is uh, yanak, which means to suck causatively to give milk. And then, and then she will give her son. Okay. 
until he's weaned. So this word that's translated as wean is gamal. It means to treat a person well or ill, that is, benefit or requite by implication of toil, to ripen, that is specifically to wean. Bestow on, deal bountifully, do good, recompense, requite. So, you know, that word wean, it, you know, it's not a word we commonly use anymore um, in English, but even the Hebrew word has quite a broad, like a lot of Hebrew words, broad definitions. Okay. So what is the significance then of this weaning? Like just from us symbolically. So we have this, this child. It's going to be born, but he's not going to be lent to the Lord until he's weaned. Okay. So let's look at some verses. Oh, about wean, wean from, from the milk and drawn from the breast. I think that's how it goes in Isaiah 28, 9, 10. And 13. Yeah. That's where I'm just going right here. Um, yeah. Uh, to whom he said, okay, I got to go back and read a few more verses. So obviously we know Isaiah 28 here. I'll share the screen so people can see it. Now, of course, this is, uh, um, Isaiah making a prophecy against the drunkards of Ephraim, Ephraim's northern Israel and, uh, woe to the crowd of pro crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. His glorious beauty he is a fading flower. Right now, it says in verse three, the crowd of crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet. Now, when we think about the trotting under feet, wh where do we connect that to? In in Daniel, but I can't recall the verse difference. Yeah, well, well, yeah. So you're going to have uh, the 1260 years of of uh, the papacy. Because the papacy is going to tread under feet. He's going to tread the holy city 42 months, right? He's going to stamp, right? Tread, tramp, right? So this is a work of, of the papacy. And, and remember that Ephraim is, of course, the northern tribe. And when they're, when the time of the treading ends in 1798, it's the time of the end, right? Um, so it's referring to that period of time, right? So we know that they, this is referring to the Protestants who are persecuted during that 1260. But here, you know, this is talking about literal northern Israel, Ephraim. And the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. And that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory. So we got this crown of pride. But in that day, the Lord of hosts shall be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue or the remnant of his people. Right. So the remnant is the final end. Right. Those that are left. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. But they also have erred through wine, through strong drink, are they out of the way. And the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. So this is obviously referring to false doctrines, false teachings, right? It's not really referring directly to alcohol. It's referring to these false doctrines, right? So they err in vision. And that word vision there, remember, we have different words that are translated in Hebrew as the word vision. In this case, it's going to be, um, let's see here. Well, I guess I could just do it this way. It'd be easier for everybody to see this. 7203. So this is a completely different word. Now, this is not... Uh, because we have Kazon, we have Mara, Mara. Um, but this one is uh, really referring to a seer, right? So this is, and, and a seer is something, what does a seer do? I always is thought a more? seer referred to a prophet of God. He, well, he sees, <laughs> right? Yeah, a visionary. <laughs> yeah, so he sees, right? That's why he's called a seer, Okay. Uh, it was kind of a, um, I wanted the obvious answer. Um, 
So if somebody errs in seeing, that is, he stumbles in judgment. That's a parallel kind of idea. So you can see that somebody who's drunk spiritually isn't going to perceive things correctly. And um, he's not going to be stable on his feet, right? So he's going to make bad decisions. Anybody who's ever been drunk or seen somebody drunk, you can recognize this. But this is talking spiritually. For all the tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean, right? So this is the condition of God's people. And then the question is, whom shall he teach knowledge and, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Um, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts, right? And then we have this little saying in Hebrew, tzav le tzav, tzav le tzav, kav le kav, kav le kav, right? It's like a little child's rhyme, for precept must be upon precept. So precept, the basic word there, uh, a precept is, a, is an idea or something that's organized, right? It's, it's, it's put in order. It's like a teaching, a rule, right? A law, right, in that sense. Like not like a law where the government makes a law you can't speed, but a law like a law in physics, the law of gravity, right? That type of law. So it's something where we we, we have the precepts. So we're going to set in order, and then line upon line, line upon line. So a line here is a measuring line. So we're going to put in order upon a line, and the line is also used as a line of judgment, right? And then. From here in to here, or here and here, right? It says here a little and there a little. Uh, so it is um, Sham, I always forget that one, Sham, Zayar, right? Um, so, so a little here, a little there, I guess, is here, uh, is what, what, what that means. So we understand this to be a reform line. We take, we put in order the events, the way marks upon a line. And we, we mark those, those events, right? So that's what we believe that, uh, that we do. So we have to be weaned in order to then be taught, right? This, this method. Okay. So we know, um, Paul talks about this in, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 2, he says, uh, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, which is solid food. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. And in Hebrews 5, verse 12, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat okay so i guess i could have clicked on that verse like that makes it bigger down at the bottom so so milk is what first understanding okay first understanding um we got this I verse could... first peter 2 2 says as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby could we also call that like a surface reading of the word? Well, well, I don't know about necessarily surface reading. I mean, it's the first principles of the oracles of God. It's the, it's, it's the thing that a child needs to learn, right? You know, like everything I need to, needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten, so to speak, right? There's some basic principles that, that we need to start with in studying God's word, right? We have to we have to see ourselves as a sinner and come to God. That is, we need to study God's word, seeking salvation, right? But God also requires us, you know, to move on, right? Not that, you know, we, we stop studying his word, but we see things in his word that is we put into practice uh, the things that we have learned, you know, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of, of him that sent me and to finish the work, right? So sometimes we think about meat as just like, 
you know, more intellectual or deeper things of understanding. But I think it's more the practical application of of God's word. That is, we grow and we're strengthened. And sure, it, it does include a deeper understanding of the scriptures. But it's 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 a very practical understanding of how God is working. We're cooperating with God in his work of salvation for others. Right. We also have fasting as well, which is used in scripture um, as a symbol. The first sermon I ever did was called Milk, Meat and Fasting. So and that was what, what it was about. That was a long time ago. But that was the thing that God showed me back then is is that. Christianity needs to be put into practice, which is something I had to learn back then because I was more just intellectual, not very uh, practical. And as a young man, totally useless. But anyway, so we can see here then in this story uh, the significance of her weaning the child prior to having him serve in the temple. So, however, you know, we look at it from a practical point of view of, of what Hannah is thinking, we can still see it as in symbolically that he needs to be weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. He needs to study precept upon precept, line upon line. Or, and, and we can see that this is going to be addressing the lines, right? That's what I believe that we see here, that there is going to be things that we're going to understand from this that uh, are not readily evident, you know, just in, in just reading the story. We have to, we have to put it upon a line. Okay. So then it says in verse 24, and when she had weaned him, she took him up and with her three bullocks, one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh and the child was young. So uh, let's, and I just wanted to look this word young, Nahar, a boy, uh, as active from the age of infancy to adolescence by implication of servant also. So, so he's definitely not a baby anymore. And go back to this other document. Okay. So now she's going to take him up. Okay, so Angela has a comment there. I have a friend who said she refuses to become a Christian because of the horrible examples she's seen in the local SDA churches and because she was abused attending a Catholic school. We need to keep our spiritual shoe leather well cared for. Okay, I'm not sure, I am not. don't know what spiritual shoe leather is, but uh, I think I get the idea. Well, uh, I... Oh, you're, you're, you're muted there, Angela. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, sometimes you you might have heard heard that statement. The only gospel that some folks will hear is that that which is clothed in shoe leather. So I figure I can kind of almost joke with her, where she's there's no gospel preaching in this home, no Bible. And then I say I love Jesus, and then she'll burst out laughing. You know? But she's explained to me I will not become a Christian because of this and this and this. And and she and I get along really really well. So I as she said the only thing I abide by is the Ten Commandments. She said all priests do that. I could have told her that Satanists don't do that, but yeah. I just let her talk, you know. So she and I yeah. are quite close, and I think that she will come to Christ. Just can't force it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so when she had weaned him, okay, she's gonna have these three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine. Okay. What's being symbol symbolized here? I mean, we have these bullocks, so there's, so that's, so she's, she's giving quite an expensive offering. A bullock is worth a lot. Any initial thoughts on this? So 40 liters of grain or flour. And 40, 40 liters, where do you get that? Uh, from Brown Driver Briggs. And it says nine imperial gallons. So, I mean, those are not American gallons either. No, so they're not. Yeah, because nine imperial gallons, almost 10, 10 American gallons. Okay. Our gallons are bigger than yours. Right. I know that. Yeah. 
I, I always thought the Imperial was like five quarts instead of four quarts. I don't know, because our quarts are different than yours. <laughs> we have four quarts in, in an Imperial gallon. But, yeah, I'm not really sure how big an American gallon is. I just know it's a lot smaller. 128 ounces. Yeah, but again, ounces are you're using. Your ounces a are. Than a liter. We have the same amount of ounces, the same amount of things, but everything's bigger. A Canadian uh, an ounce is bigger than an American ounce. Okay. In volume. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't doesn't help much. I'd have to put it into liters, I guess. Okay. Just trying to think here, which one we got going on. So, um, so skin bag of wine, ya yaying. That's just uh, whether that's uh, now. Of course, when we think of wine in the Bible, it's not French wine, right? Now, wine can get pretty fermented and become alcoholic, but it's not always, right? <clears throat> so we don't know what the, that is exactly. I don't. I don't know. If um, in the sanctuary, you wouldn't bring fermented wine as an offering. So I'm not sure particularly what what the bottle of wine is. But you got the flower. That's definitely, and the bullocks, those are offerings. So she brings these unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Do we see any symbolism here that's readily evident? Okay, it says, and then they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And he said, oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee praying unto the Lord. For this child, I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. So uh, so they, slew, they, they uh, offer one of the bullocks. So I'm not really sure exactly what happens with the other two bullocks. It doesn't say what they do with the flower, just that they bring it. So it's probably an offering. And then they brought the child to Eli. Any thoughts on this section? Can we gather anything from these, the bullocks, the flower, and the wine? I mean, these are offerings, an animal offering, uh, a wheat offering, and a drink offering. <clears throat> well, here, here in the situation, to be able to offer a bullock, mm -hmm. This had to be a family that was fairly well-to-do. Yeah. Because let's recall that the offering that was presented when Christ as a baby was presented at the temple, that they were only able to, to offer a turtle dove, right? Yeah. So the family of Elkanah is presenting not one, but three bullocks. Yeah along with the, the ephah of flour and a bottle of wine. Yeah. Now, yeah, and of course, you have to have money if you got two wives, too. You either have to have money or lack of sense. <laughs> yeah, or both. But, uh... Yeah. <laughs> so, situation here, would we look at the bottle of wine being doctrine, but what would we see the bullocks and the flower as being? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, flour is something that's been refined. So it's not just a grain offering. I mean, it is a grain offering, but it's been refined already. Uh, so this would be it's something that's already ground. Kamak in Hebrew. But the bread, the wine, and sacrifice. Yeah. But we got three bullocks. So our... Are the three bullocks another reference to the message of Revelation 14? Well, the three angels' messages, yeah. Uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking, that, that the number three there connected to the three angels' messages. Could it, but it, could it also be connected to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, yeah. But I, st I still think primarily here, if we're going to put this into the line, I think that this would be the proclamation of the message. So we have, you know, the what what we have represented here in this story is the three angels' messages being repeated. Okay, now Jacob's comment is also quite good. 
Yeah, from so the chair. could be a representation of a sin offering. Yep. And the flower and wine is representing the body and blood of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if it was, be, yeah. Go if on. Representative of the sin offering is this representative of the three steps justification, sanctification, and judgment going in and through the uh, the sanctuary. Yeah. Now, the thing about a bullock, uh, because, you know, these offerings, they have, I mean, obviously you can offer a bullock as a sin offering. I'm just, so let me see what we got here in, um, right. So in Leviticus uh, chapter four is where you're going to have the various sin offerings, right? And so, um, so there's four different classes of sin offerings, the ones for the priest, the ones for the congregation, the ones for the king, right? And the ones for um, the the common people. Um, so let me see here. So it's going to say, um, right, and this is, of course, unwitting sins, right? That is, there's no offering made for, for willful sin in the sanctuary. Right. Yeah. Angela's comment that the symbol of Ephraim was a bull yeah. should also be well accepted. Yes. So Ephraim is is symbolized by a bull. That's true. Right. So we got uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The bull represents Ephraim. We have um, uh, there's the four four banners. I can't remember them all. We have a man, which is Reuben, and then we have uh, the eagle or serpent, which is, I um, can't remember which one that is. Dan. Dan, right. The backbiter. The serpent right. in the way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So so we have um, the, the symbol. So we, we could connect this to Ephraim, which is the largest of the tribes, sometimes referred to as Joseph. Okay. So anyway, in Leviticus chapter four, he shall bring the bullock unto the door. So if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring forth his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. Right. So he lays his hand upon the head. That's the transfer of sins to the animal. The priest that is anointed shall take the bullock's blood and bring it into the tabernacle of the congregation, sprinkles the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense. So the altar of incense in the holy place. Um, and shall pull all, pour all of the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering which is in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. It's going to burn the fat, um, takes the kidneys and the fat and the flanks, the liver, the kidneys, he shall take away, right? So, um, um, so the inwards, inward parts, and he's taken off the bullock and the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of burnt offering, right? So it's, and it's pretty typical what happens here with other offerings. Skin of the bullock and all the flesh with his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung. Even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him upon the wood with fire. When the ashes are poured out, shall he be burned. And then the next one is if the whole congregation of his in Israel sin through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly. And they that have done somewhat any of commandments of the Lord against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty. When the sin which they have sinned against them is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. Right. So similar types of things uh, dealing with uh, how the sacrifice is dealt with. And when the ruler hath sinned and hath done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty. Or if he sin whereeth he has sin, come to his knowledge, and he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats. So we're going to see that the priest and uh, the congregation have the bullock, but for 
uh, the ruler, which would include a king, um, that's going to be a goat offering, right? And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance while he doeth somewhat against the commandments of the Lord, that's verse 27 of Leviticus 4, or if he sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, right? So the male is going to be for the ruler, but for the individual, it's a female, right? Okay, so so these bullocks, anyway, the symbol there has to do with the priest or the congregation, if it's going to be offered as a sin offering. Now, it doesn't say specifically here it's a sin offering. This is an offering, but it's a pretty expensive one. So they slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli. And then she's going to tell him why she did this, why she's... Uh, giving him, lending him to the Lord, right? Therefore, also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So if we have he's worshiping the Lord, do we know who the he is referring to? The only he's that we're referring to in this portion are either Elkanah or Samuel. Right. Or or Eli, but... Um, so Eli could be worshiping the Lord because of Samuel being brought to him, right? So we have three possibilities. It could refer to Elkanah or it could refer to Samuel. So we always have these problems in Hebrew. Okay. Um, now, we do, if, I don't know if we have, okay, so here we have um, from Patriarchs and Prophets 570, um, Hannah's prayer was granted. She received the gift for which she had so earnestly entreated. As she looked upon the child, she called him Samuel, asked of God. As soon as the little one was old enough to be separated from his mother, she fulfilled her vow. She loved her child with all the devotion of a mother's heart. Day by day, as she watched his expanding powers and listened to his childish prattle, her affections entwined about him more closely. He was her only son the special gift of heaven, but she had received him as a treasure consecrated to God, and she would not withhold from the giver his own. Okay, so that's, it doesn't, doesn't really help us here on, on knowing uh, who the he is referring to. I, I, I sort of take the position that it's Eli that's worshiping the Lord in that, because what God has done in giving her this child and now he has this child to to work in the sanctuary. So he's going to be a blessing to Eli. But it could just refer to Elkanah. I don't think it's likely, likely it refers to Samuel. He's just a little child. Yeah, all, I'm, all I was doing is looking at the possibilities. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I realize that. I was doing the same thing. Just we got We got three he's. Right. Now. Couldn't the three he's. He's be like the three a.m. They're all all they're three and yet they're one. Interesting concept. Can three be a symbol of uh, completeness too? Yeah, could be. Now I'm just looking here in this uh, alternate translation. Therefore, also I have returned him whom I have obtained by petition. He whom I have obtained by petition. So they're not using the word lent. Sha'al or sha'al. To inquire by implication to request or demand. But it also can mean lend. Okay, so, but originally it means to petition. So petitioned, so therefore also I have. And I don't know where they get returned him. Because, um, so they have, therefore also I have returned him whom I have obtained by petition. Now, in the Hebrew, we just have, therefore also I have asked him to the Lord or inquired him to the Lord as long as he liveth or all his days, and he shall be lent to the Lord. Now, here they have, as long as he liveth, he, he whom I have obtained. I think that must be a typo that he is doubled. I don't think it's not in the Hebrew. Uh, we just have the one he that's that's a 
a separate word. And interesting, in Hebrew, the word he is pronounced. He, he shall be petitioned to the Lord. Now, the word worshipped is interesting. It's uh, the Hebrew, it's shakha, but it's the Hebrew number 7812. So that's interesting. Okay, any final thoughts? So we're going to come back to this on Sunday. And I'm going to try to figure out what I can do with this whole chapter, how to sort of deal with it. So no thoughts? Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time we've had here this morning. We feel so insufficient to understand everything in your word. And we just pray that as we study individually, that you can guide and direct us as we come together on Sunday. We pray for the studies tomorrow evening and Sabbath morning. And we ask, Lord, that you can watch over each one, that you can guide our day. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.